Okay, good evening. Got one of these? Make sure you have the right one. It says at the top, Principles of Bible Study number three, context. Got the right one? Good. So this is the third week. The first week we did a little introduction. Last week we discussed final authority, that being not just any Bible, but the King James Bible and some nuances about the King James Bible that actually give you insight. And we are hopping into what is really principle number one, the third study, but principle number one tonight, and that is context. So let's start off here in 2 Peter chapter 1, everybody. In your Bible, in your New Testament, towards the back, Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, and then 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. So these lessons are designed to give you the ability to read and understand your Bible so that you might apply it. You should not be relying on me or pastor or anybody else to feed you. Now you should get fed when you come to church, but you also should get fed when you are at home, when it's just you and the Lord. So I know when I first started really getting interested in Bible study, learning these principles made all the difference and gave me a lot of light on the scriptures that I did not have before. They're very basic, but they're very profound. So let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1 and down to verse 20, the last two verses in the chapter. The Bible says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So let's point out something there about verse 20. The, the big thing I want to emphasize is the scripture is not to be interpreted privately. Here's what that means. In a lot of Bible, quote, Bible studies today, a passage is read, and then there's a trip around the room with all the people saying, this is what the passage means to me. And then the next person says something different. And the next person says something different. Folks, who's right? Thank you. That's the right answer. The Bible is right. So if somebody actually has what it means to them and it lines up with what is plainly taught in the scriptures, then they have the right interpretation. So if you're not familiar with what, what the Bible calls private interpretation, I will show you some examples tonight. You'll kind of laugh maybe at a couple of them, but... It's, they're out there. So let's uh, ask the Lord to help us as we jump out into this. And again, these lessons are designed to go fairly quick, but you got to use them to be effective. So if you learn it, but then never put it to use, it's really as if you never learned it. So we'll try to get this here in the next half hour or so. And then this week, you can put it into action as you read and study your Bible. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we ask for you to help us tonight understand this most important principle of context. I pray that I would not make the Bible say something that it doesn't. None of us would as we go through our week. We would just believe what you tell us and allow you to interpret it for us. I just pray for everyone who hears tonight that we would take in this most valuable information from you and that you might be our teacher and that we would use the tools that you're giving us here and knowing how to read and understand our Bibles. And I pray that this would result in lives right here in this place being transformed as a result of your word being put into action in our lives. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So how would you like it if you made a statement for the purpose of communicating a very important truth, but it was misconstrued by the hearer and the message you intended to be sent was drastically changed when it was communicated to somebody else. I'm actually on a little bullet point there. I skipped that first thing. I'll come back to that. But this is what we're talking about. Has anybody ever had your own words that you spoke taken out of context? It results in a major misunderstanding. In fact, you might have had somebody really upset with you because you said something, but you really didn't say that. They only heard part of what you said and they did not get 
the statement in the proper context. So this is the first of several principles. Let me back up to the little statement there where you have a blank. I know that uh, whenever I do this at school and I skip a blank, the kids go crazy. And it, some of them just cannot handle it. You have to go in order. You have to give me the blank in order that it occurs. So I'm going to do that. So back up to that first statement under the, under the verses. It says, there are some very important Bible study principles, or you could call them rules. Principles or rules that must be followed so that the proper interpretation takes place. If you don't follow the rules, there are always consequences, correct? So I played, I played baseball for a long time, coached baseball for a long time. And in baseball, you don't just get to steal first base. Did you know that? You can't just run down there whenever you want. Now, if the pitcher hits you with a ball, you can go to first base. If it's ball four, you can go to first base. If you hit the ball and the fielder doesn't make a play before you get to first base, you can stay there. But if in the middle of an at-bat, let's say I walk to the plate, the pitcher throws ball one, and I run down to first base, and I plant myself on first base, what's going to happen? That umpire is going to be furious with me because I did not follow the rules. And if you break the rules, there are consequences. The same is true in sports as in studying your Bible. Stick with these rules of Bible study, and I tell you, it will, you will not be misled. So I found an article here. This is the little illustration you have on your page there. And I put on the page that you're, you have with you, Dr. Fauci. By the way, I haven't heard about him in a long time, have you? He's just kind of disappeared. <laughs> okay. Appreciate that. Yep. He kind of just disappeared. And I don't, I'm not concerned with where you stand on this issue. That's not the point. My point is to show you a real illustration of some things that took place just a couple of years ago now that Dr. Fauci claimed were taken out of context. In fact, this is from The Guardian, and the title of the article is called Anthony Fauci Criticizes Donald Trump for Using His Words Out of Context. So Dr. Fauci was upset with the president because he said something, but it was not in the right context whenever it was used. So I'll read a little bit of this to you just to get you an idea. Dr. Anthony Fauci, the U U.S. top infect infectious disease expert, has criticized Donald Trump's re-election campaign for using his words out of context to make it appear as if he was praising the president's handling of the coronavirus pandemic. So here's what Dr. Fauci said. I never publicly endorsed any political candidate. The comments attributed to me without my permission in the, it was essentially the Trump, the Republican campaign ad, were taken out of context from a broad statement I made months ago about the efforts of federal health, public health officials. So the campaign ad was a video that's, that has Dr. Dr. Fauci saying the following, quote, I can't imagine that anyone could be doing more, end of quote. It was in reference to, well, the advertisement was putting that quote in reference to President Trump's response to COVID-19. And Dr. Fauci said, that's not what I said. I was not praising the president. What he did say is he was praising the White House uh, Coronavirus Task Force, for the work that they had done to combat the virus. Now, again, I, I'm not concerned about whether Dr. Fauci was right or whether they took it out of context, but isn't it interesting that you can actually spin a message any way you choose if you take a little out of the broad statement? Are you with me? So here's a broad statement. To get all the information in the proper context, you need to read the whole thing. But if you take a little snippet out of that, and say, look what he said, then you can make people say anything they want. Have you seen the news media do this over and over? They take little statements. They don't include the broad. They take a little sentence, and then they spin it, and people get mad, and rightfully so, because you don't want your words taken out of context, do you? You want, now let me put it like this. You want to say certain things, and you mean what you say, 
the way you said them. Did you catch that? You mean what you say the way you said it. And you don't want to be taken out of context. God means what he said the way he said it. And he, to get what he actually said properly, you must get it in the proper context. So let's look at the word. Con. Text. So uh, anybody know Spanish in here? Chile con carne. That is chili with the right way, with, with meat. I don't, you wouldn't have chili if you didn't have meat, right? And the word C-O-N actually even in English is used to represent the word with. So con text, what's that mean? With text, what comes before, what comes after, so that you get the middle correct and you interpret it the way God wants it interpreted, not the way you want it interpreted. Okay, back to the sheet here. I have here, God's words are intended to be read how? In context. Taking scripture out of context leads to false doctrine. The blank is false. False doctrine and the big blank, misunderstanding. False doctrine and misunderstanding is a result of words being taken out of context. And then I put here, and we will actually talk more about this in a, another principle that we'll hit down the road. Most heresies are truths out of place. So you take a verse, and it's, a, it's obviously, if it's in the Bible, it's true. But if you rip it out of its proper context, you can make it, Say something that it does not say. So most heresies are truths that are out of place. They are misplaced. So you're in 2 Peter 1. Go to chapter 3. And this idea of the scriptures being twisted is not any new thing. In fact, I believe after we read these verses, you'll see that even back in the days of Peter and Paul, people were taking scripture out of context and they were having a hard time understanding it. Or they were teaching false doctrine. Look at verse 15. 2 Peter 3, look down there at verse 15. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So this is Peter talking about Paul's letters. Look at verse 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things... Hard to be what? Understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. That's with the W, not, not with just the R, with the W on the front. They rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. And the idea going on here is that scriptures, even back in Peter and Paul's day, were being twisted. And what happens? What's the verse say? That word rest, is that, that's the idea there with the W. What was happening and what does happen today when people rest the scriptures? What's the result? What can happen to them? What's it say? They can be destroyed. Destruction. So, anytime you study the Bible, you must ask the question, what is the context? I would say it like this. This is not on the sheet, but context is king. I am hitting this principle first because it is so important. So the first thing there under 2 Peter 3.15, what is the context? That's the question you need to ask. So let's get to point number one. What is context? So let's get a definition here. What does it mean when we say the word context? I already gave you a little bit about that, but let's put it real clear here. Context equals, right under point number one, defining context. Context equals the parts of a discourse that surround surround a word or passage and can throw light on its meaning so the the parts that surround a word or passage that can throw light on its meaning now the next thing i'm going to tell you here before i tell you what the blank is how many of you remember back when you were in school when you read works of literature and one of the things that the teacher said over and over is 
hey, before we start reading, we must find out what the setting is. You ever hear that? The setting? When did it happen? Who's doing the writing? Who are they writing to? That was the idea. You wanted to make sure that if you were reading A Tale of Two Cities, did y'all read that when you were in school? A Tale of Two Cities is an incredible book. You better make sure that that's during the French Revolution. And if you don't understand that, you, it can lead a lot of confusion along the way while you're reading the book. So setting and context are very similar, very related. So let's go to Isaiah. Go to your Old Testament, Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, duh, obviously I'm going to read scripture in context. I mean, you folks especially, you're used to this. But I will give you some examples here in a minute of false doctrines that are all over the world due to scriptures being taken out of context. So just bear with me. We'll get there. Isaiah 28. Now, this is actually the way the Bible is supposed to be read. And I think that these verses we'll read go hand in hand with this idea of the importance of context. Isaiah 28, 9. 28, 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Now, before I go on, don't you want knowledge and doctrine from the scriptures? Let's see if you qualify. Let's read the rest of the verse. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. So when you get saved, you're born again. And what does a baby need? Milk. And then a baby begins to grow as a result. And then they need more food and they need solid food. And then eventually had some last night, some strong meat, some steak, right? And that comes in time. But see if you qualify by looking at verse nine and saying, was there a time when I actually was born again and then partook of the milk of God's word? And if that's you, then this is applied. This applies to you. Look at verse 10 for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So I have here a precept on your sheet. A precept or line cannot be isolated. What does it mean to be isolated? If you isolate yourself from the rest of the church, you are all by yourself, all alone. Folks, the Bible, the words of God are not supposed to be isolated so that you say, I'm going to take this phrase or this verse or this couple of verses and put them over here and I'm going to separate them from the context they appear in. Not supposed to do that. Did you notice how it says there? You're supposed to stack scripture one on top of another. Line up on line, line up on line, precept on precept, precept on precept. So look at the, the blank below that where I have italicized and bold. It says, taking verses out of context is nothing more than cherry picking. Cherry picking verses, usually to fit a certain doctrine that may not even be in the scriptures. So don't cherry pick verses. Y'all know what I mean by that, right? Don't just say, well, I like this verse. I'll go over here and I... I'll take this verse way over here. I'm going to tell you one of the most, let me show you real quick, one of the most misused pieces of scripture. Go to Jeremiah 29. I don't have this on your notes, but just since you're not far away from it in Isaiah, go to Jeremiah 29. Now, every time, every year that it comes graduation time, you can find coffee mugs and cards and banners with this verse on it that I'm about to read. And it's a good verse. It's a great verse. And there's, on one hand, there's not a lot of danger in using it in that context. Context. However, at the same time, there is some danger. So look at verse 11. And I'm just going to take this right in the middle of the chapter without reading anything before. Look at verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. So people take that and they say, hey, graduate, God has nothing but peaceful thoughts towards you. No evil will happen to you. Is that true? Hello, is that true? No. Now that is just yanking that verse out of context. Now all we got to do, I don't even read the whole chapter. Read verse 10 to get the context here. Now there's more to this, but 10 will give you a lot. See if you can determine the setting of this passage. For thus saith the Lord, 
that after 70 years be accomplished to Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Folks, have you ever been to Babylon? Anybody here been to Babylon? Does that apply to you? What if you have been in Babylon? Does that apply to you? No. Who does this apply to? Who was in Babylon for 70 years? The Jews, that was their judgment. God kicked them out of the land and they got carried off to Babylon and they spent 70 years in Babylon. And the Lord was reminding them, say, hey, after 70 years are up, I got something for you and it's good. And that's where verse 11 comes in. So you see, there's danger in taking verses out of context. Just one example. Now, uh, you should be on the back here. Let's get to point number two. And at the top of the page, let me finish this other point here. The authentic meaning of scripture, the real meaning, God's meaning, is derived from the word I put here is stacking. And I did that on purpose. Stacking verses in succession. So stacking, if you're going to stack anything, you got to have more than one, right? And you start off with one on the bottom and you put one on the top and another one, another one, another one, another one. Folks, how's the Bible laid out? You got a book and you got a chapter. Verse, 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 verse. Then a new chapter. Verse, 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 verse. And what you do with chapter two is you put it on top of chapter one so that you get chapter two in the proper. And then going further than that, where's the book found in the Bible? You even got to determine that so that you don't yank it out of context. You are not an Old Testament Jew under the law. Hallelujah. Therefore, when you read Leviticus about offering a peace offering and a sin offering and a trespass offering, you don't have to do that. Amen? Is there value in you reading Leviticus? You better believe it. There's so much spiritual truth there that you can connect to the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you. So there's all kinds of things in there for you today to grab out. But you have to understand the context and who it's written to. It's not written to you or else we better build a temple. We better start rounding up some animals. But it's not to us, right? So get it in the right context. Now, the next thing, distorting context. Here's what I have here. Many people, this is kind of funny, but it's also not so funny when we get to the end of this. Many people do not know where to start reading in the Bible. So they use the, what's called the lucky dip method say, what's that? They say, Lord, show me where you want me to read. And they randomly open their Bible and start reading wherever the Bible happens to open. Folks, this is dangerous. Now, I'm going to confess, I used to do this. Okay, I'm reading in Isaiah today. That is, now, hey, at least you're reading your Bible, amen? At least somebody getting their Bible. you got to give credit. At the same time, now this is, this is kind of comical what I'm about to read to you, but I hope you understand the point behind this. The story is told of a man who used the lucky dip method. We just read about it. The first verse he happened to turn to was Matthew 27, verse 5. And it says over there in Matthew 27, 5, Judas went and hanged himself. So that's the first verse he reads. Well, he was not sure how this verse applied to him. So he decided to flip over to another passage. And he happened to open to Luke 10, 37, which says, then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. <laughs> the man was quite upset. He did not know how he could obey. So he decided to turn to one more passage. Again, he opened the Bible at random, and to his horror, his finger fell upon John 13, 27. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. As you can see, this method could easily cause a person to take verses out of context and could lead to great danger. You see that now? Is that likely to happen? No. But you understand. Those are just three passages, and if somebody was really thinking, i got to apply anything I read, and they go randomly to one passage after another, you can get all messed up. So, stay away from that. Taking Scripture out of context can cause a person to, number one, never be saved due to never hearing the truth. 
hearing nothing but false doctrine, a false gospel, never being saved. Now, the first example I'm going to show you tonight will, will reveal that, how that can happen. So out of context, a person can never get saved because they never hear a clear gospel message. Number two, maybe they get saved, but they never grow because they're taking in more false doctrine. So this is, folks, souls are at stake when it comes to the Bible. You know that. So we don't want to make God say something he didn't. And you do that by reading scripture in the, in the right context. You, you get what God really said by taking it in context. All right. First example of distortion of context. Now you've seen these before. But they're always good to go over again. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Let's see what heresy we can teach over here in John 3 by taking a verse, a single verse, out of context. John 3, 5. Oh, by the way, a church 100, 200 yards from here, what they teach is going to line up real close to what I'm going to show you here from John 3, 5. John 3, 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Folks, there it is. It says you've got to be born of water and of the Spirit. You must be baptized in order to be saved, according to John 3, 5. Call me out, somebody. That's false doctrine. What I just said is false doctrine. You know why? I did that on purpose. Number one, to see if you're paying attention. Number two, to show you how verses taking out of context lead to destruction. If you really believe you got to be baptized to be saved, you're, you're giving somebody a false gospel. You don't have to be baptized to be saved. Now, should you get baptized? Yeah, but you don't get baptized to be saved. There's a fella, and the Church of Christ is the church that pushes this probably the hardest. There's a fella, we were, this is several years ago, I was down in Cocoa Beach holding up signs. And a fella walks up to me, and he's, he's, he's a little younger than me, and he's really fired up, mad. And he confronted me about what was on the sign. And I think that day I had the sign that said, it's a very simple sign. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Probably that sign. And he had a fit. And he starts pushing this false a gospel which is a false gospel of you have to be baptized so here's what i told the guy i said listen man if you really believed that a person has to be baptized to be saved why don't you join me down here on the street and bring a baptistry along with you a little portable baptistry you can plant down here and you can tell people hey if you want to know jesus christ your savior get in the water if you really believe that but see he wasn't really serious about that and if you really nail these people down you find out what's really in their heart so it's kind of interesting. Now, does that what the verse teaches, folks? If you don't know your Bible very well, you could read that verse and somebody say, look, it says water there. It's got to be baptism. And people associate spiritual work with baptism because you probably talk to people. Hey, when did you get saved? And they tell you when they got baptized. So let's read it in the context and let's get the real meaning. Verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's a key verse right there. Born again. Verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into where? His mother's womb would be born. Notice there's a birth in verse 3. It's a second birth. There's a verse in verse 4. It's the womb birth from the mother. That's very important. You can pick up on that when you read this passage. Look at verse 5, the verse we read out of context. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, in the verse 3 and 4, there were two births. Did you see it? Born again, spiritual birth. Born from the mother's womb. That's a physical birth. And then in verse 5, Jesus says, oh yeah, there's a water birth. That's to be connected with born of your mother's womb. And then there's a being born of the spirit, which is being born again. And then to further solidify what he means, read verse 6. And I could have just read verse 6 and got this, but when you get the whole passage in context, oh, it clears things up. 
So look at verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now what birth is that? The first or the second? There's your water birth. Being born of the womb from the mother. Second part of verse 6. That which is born of the spirit, capital S, is spirit. And that's purposeful, little s. It's a spiritual birth that happens through the Holy Spirit. That's being born again. So I know you folks have been here at church a while. You know this. You're like, well, yeah, that's very clear. People go to that passage. Church of Christ preachers go to that passage and say, look, you got to get in the water to be saved. No, actually, you had to come out of the water. And then you had to be born by the Spirit to be saved. Being coming out of the water had to do with coming out of your mother's womb. Didn't mama's water break? Isn't that what happens? Okay, so there's your water birth. See, it's very simple if you just read it in context. Now go to Matthew 7. This is a fun one right here. I guarantee you probably everybody here, or close to everybody here, has heard what I'm about to preach here out of context. And then I'll clear the whole thing up. Matthew 7, 1. This is distortion of the context. Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. Now you've heard that misread. People say, judge not lest ye be judged. Have you heard people say that? That's not what the Bible says for one. But here's what they mean when they say that. Don't judge me. You're, the Bible says you're not supposed to judge other people. You ever heard anybody say that? That's one verse in a chapter with 29 verses. Let's just read a few more so we get the, get that context. Verse 2, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Now, if you read verses 1 through 5, like we just did, you really find out the teaching has to do with if you're going to judge somebody, you better be doing the same thing that you're telling somebody else to do. If you're going to say, I cannot believe you, and you fill in the blank, and then you're doing the very thing that you said they shouldn't do, what are you according to the Bible? A hypocrite. So the Bible does not tell you not to judge. In fact, John 7, 24, you might want to write that verse down. It says over there, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You're commanded to judge in John 7, 24. Matthew 7, 1 does not say that you should never judge. It tells you to be careful when you judge because you need to look in the mirror first. See what happens when you get in context? But then these people who don't know anything about the Bible, see, the Bible says you're not supposed to judge me. And they just don't want their sin exposed is usually what it is, right? That's, that's usually why that, where that comes from. So if I didn't give you the blank on that first one, John 3, 5, out of context, it's used to teach that baptism is essential for salvation. And then on Matthew 7, 1, out of context, it's used to teach that we are not to judge others. But we are supposed to judge others. <laughs> But if you take it out of context, you could say, look, we're not supposed to judge other people. Okay, y'all with me? Everybody with me so far? How about one more? This is a fun one. Go to Amos chapter 4. Amos chapter 4. I'm going to rip this verse right out of its context. Find Daniel and then go to the right. Hosea, Joel, and then Amos chapter 4. I'm actually only going to read a little small portion of this verse. And I'm going to intentionally take it out of context then i'm going to preach on it four four y'all there come to bethel and transgress at gilgai gilgal multiply transgression folks the bible says that you're supposed to go out and sin if you take just that part of that verse out of context you see the mess you end up in. You need to make sure you read the verses before at least to get the proper context. I mean, you read the whole chapter here, but let's just read. See if you can figure out what, why that's the Lord talking there. 
And why would the Lord say that? He did say what he said in verse 4. Why did he say that? Let's read verse 1. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan, that are in the mountain of Samaria, which oppress the poor, which crush the needy, which say to their masters, bring and let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness that, lo, the day shall come upon you, that he will take you away with hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. And ye shall go out at the breaches, every cow at that which is before her, and ye shall cast them into the palace, saith the Lord. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression and bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving like leaven and proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this liketh you, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. And what was happening is you had these Israelites who were a bunch of hypocrites. And they were actually offering the sacrifices, but not from the heart. They weren't doing it for the right reason. They were doing it out of tradition. And behind the scenes, you know what they were doing? All kinds of wickedness. So the Lord is being, this is a, a tool that you can use effectively if used properly. The Lord is using a little bit of sarcasm with these Israelites. That's what he's doing. Oh, right, just go ahead and go transgress. Go ahead. Because that was what they had been doing. And he's saying, you want to go that way? You can go that way. But it's sarcasm. And sarcasm used effectively Sarcasm used properly can be actually very effective. So if you take it out of context, what do you get right there? Permission to sin. Is God giving you license to sin, permission to sin? Good night, no. Of course not. So out of context, it could be used to justify sin. And then we read, obviously, to get the context. Now let's get to this last point here. Questions so far? Comments? Does that make sense? See how little portions read all alone by themselves can lead to all kinds of bad interpretation, wrong interpretation, and false doctrine. So discovering context. Here's the next thing. The little bullet point says, every book, chapter, verse, and word. I'll say it again. Every book, chapter, verse verse and word in the Bible has a specific doctrinal context. And as we go through these lessons, we will actually come back to this principle and it'll be needed to understand other principles as we go. So this one is very foundational. Now, how about, let's do a little practice here. Let's see if we can get through at least a couple of these. Go to Joel chapter one, Joel chapter one, Old Testament, you're in Amos, right before Amos, go to the left, Joel. Uh, Joel chapter 2, sorry. It says Joel, Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Let's see if we can get the context. Now, these are actually, uh, with the exception of the Matthew 24 passage, the first verse in the chapter. And it's always good to go back to the beginning of the chapter, at least the chapter, to really find out what's happening. But there's a whole bunch of descriptions in this chapter. Let me just skip down to verse 3 before we read verse 1, and then we'll come back. Look at verse 3. A fire devoureth before them. Behind them a flame burneth. Man. Go down there to verse 6. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march everyone is on his ways. And they shall not break their ranks. When is this? This already happened or is it in the future? Well, to find out, we need to read in context what, just, what we just read, right? Let's just go back to verse 1. I think you'll get it. Chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet where? All right, that's in the Middle East. And sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Again, Middle East. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Now watch this part. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. That sets the context for all the events in the chapter. When is the, when does the rest of these events, when do the rest of these events occur? The, there you go, brother Phil, the day of the Lord. And if you don't know this, we'll spend a lesson on fra key phrases in your Bible. And this is one that we'll, ta we'll, we'll tackle. The day of the Lord has to do with the tribulation and the second coming of Christ. Not the rapture, didn't say the rapture. The tribulation and the return of Christ to this earth to set up his kingdom for a thousand years. Okay, that's the day of the Lord. So all this stuff that you read, you're reading some prophecy. It has not happened yet. All those things written there. Okay, so that's just getting, verse 1 shows you 
the setting for the rest of the chapter. Very, very important. Go to, go to the New Testament. Let's get Matthew first and we'll get James to, to wrap up there. Go to Matthew chapter 24 first. Matthew 24. One of the chapters in the Bible that is regularly taken out of context. And oh my, what a mess you make of this chapter. Unless you read the whole chapter and get the entire meaning. So look at 24.3. Now, let me show you something else that, that uh, has to do with context. How many of you have paragraph marks in your Bible? I got them in my Bible. They're actually super helpful. And if you don't go back to the beginning of the chapter, at least go to the paragraph mark. Because the paragraph mark will start a new thought. Just like if you're reading a book and the same thing, new paragraph. So let's just go to verse 3 here. As he sat, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of what? Thy coming and of the end of the world. And everything that follows. I tell you folks, there's a lot of detail here that I have heard preachers take just a couple of the verses that follow and rip them out of context and preach something that's not true. When do all these things following verse 3 happen? They happen just prior to the second coming of Christ. That's when they happen. That's very clear according to verse 3. What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So all these things that happen, I have heard preachers go to this passage and say, hey, look, uh, there's earthquakes in diverse places today. Therefore, the second coming of Christ must be really close. Well, hold on a second. For Christ to return to the earth, you first got to have the rapture. Then the tribulation, correct? And all these things that are mentioned will happen in the tribulation. So, got to be very careful with that. And there's a lot of good stuff in this chapter. And you could preach it with a spiritual application on a lot of things in this chapter. Just don't make it all for the immediate time period we're in now, the church age. Because it's not for this time yet. It's going to happen in the tribulation. You all with me? That makes sense? Go to James. James chapter 1. A lot of good stuff in James. Should you read James? Should you read Amos? Should you read uh, all those past, all those books in your Bible? Absolutely. Read them all. Can you get spiritual truth from all books in the Bible? Yes. Please read them all. The way that you stack precept upon precept, line upon line, this is the way that you do it. I, I, I learned this oh, probably 15 years ago now. I guess it was. I'm, I'm getting old. Longer than that. Getting close to 20 years ago now. Goodness. And when I finally learned this, I was like, that's how you do it. Here's how you stack you start in Genesis, you read all the way to Revelation. You go back to Genesis. Start over. Read all the way through Revelation. And you're stacking. That's what you're doing. Line up on line. Precept on precept. And when you do that, you're reading the Bible in the order that God put it. And there's great truths to be learned. Now, can you read the Bible chronologically? There's a guy that put a chronological Bible out. Hey, you want to do that? That's fine. Personally, I think God put the books in order for a reason. And they ought to be read in order. So... Let's go to James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to who? The 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. Okay. Um, Brother Mark, which tribe of Israel are you from? <laughs> Good answer. Phil, which tribe are you from? Okay, so what you need to understand here is it says to the 12 tribes, that's Israelites, does anybody know what time period this particular book was written? Anybody know? What was going on during this particular time period? What's that? Great persecution. And what were Jews doing at this time? They were leaving the promised land, the diaspora. They were getting out of there. That's why it says they were what? Scattered abroad. Now, the early church just happened to be made up of... A whole bunch of Jews, at least for a time, and then the Gentiles got it. But you need to understand, why does it say that? Now, what's interesting is, here in your Bible, the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Did you know that there's a time period also coming where the 12 tribes will be scattered? So you see, the Bible is so timeless. It was written to those people back in the uh, first century, that were those Jews scattered. And then there's going to be some specific things to... Jews looking for the truth in the tribulation found in James. Oh, and by the way, you know what else? There's stuff for you in this book in the church age. Amen? But there's, you got to make sure you understand the, the setting, the context of the book or else you kind of get messed up in some places. Last place to go. Let's wrap up here. Ecclesiastes 12. So 
Uh, if you didn't get those dots there, those bullet points, the context of Joel is just prior to the second coming of Christ. The context of James is the Jews in dispersion. And the context of Matthew 24 is, again, just before the second coming of Christ. Wasn't that easy? You just kind of back up and read a few verses before and or after. Ecclesiastes 12, let's wrap this thing up. Now, some of you might be thinking, man, that's a lot of work to do that. I got to figure all that out. That's a lot of reading and a lot of thinking. And you know what? That's right. And that's good. So we'll wrap up here tonight. Ecclesiastes 12. Go down to verse 12. 12, 12. And further, by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a what? A weariness of the flesh. So here's what I have for you. Last statement. Studying the Bible is a spiritual exercise with great benefits. A spiritual exercise with great benefits. But it requires work. <laughs> yeah. Studying the Bible is a labor Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. So again, take the principles, learn the principles. If you don't ever put them into action, you're not utilizing them properly. And a lot of people don't do that because they're lazy. It's really the truth. A lot of lazy Christians that don't want to take the time to learn the principles and then use the principles by studying their Bible. So I hope that gives you a little help. You might be thinking to yourself, people really get false doctrine from those passages and some other ones because they take it out of context. You wouldn't believe some of the nonsense I've heard over the years from people yanking verses out of context. And if you go and you witness enough and talk to people enough uh, from different denominations and talk to the Jehovah's Witness a little bit and some of these are the cult members, you will hear all kinds of nonsense from taking verses out of context. So let's be sure we don't do that. Read it in context, get the proper interpretation Due to the context. Yes, you're right. Yes. Get it. In, you're right. You're right. All right. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your words. I pray that we would utilize here, here in these days ahead, utilize the tool here that we've looked at. And I pray that we would all just let your word speak as you want it, not the way we want it. Help us this week. Protect us, we ask. We ask for your guidance and wisdom as we go our separate ways. And we all have some place to be where we... Uh, we have an opportunity to minister to others, and I pray that we would faithfully do that so that you are glorified. I pray for opportunities for all of us this week to talk to folks about their soul and about being saved. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.